Hi folks, and welcome to another episode of Open Analysis Live. So today we have something a little bit different. Uh, both Sean and I were too busy to make a video this week, but we did find an old video in our archives where we explained Visual Basic Packing, and there was a request for us to repost this. Those of you who have been with the channel for a while know that we used to have a Vimeo account, and we took those videos down when we moved to YouTube. So let's jump in the time machine, and we'll go take a look at a much younger and much less edited Sergey trying to explain how Visual Basic 6 packers can be defeated with some API hooks and the IDA debugger. Hope you enjoy and hopefully we have some time to create some new videos for you guys sometime soon. In order to get started here, I think what I'd like to do is I'd like to give you guys an overview of what a packer looks like for those of you who aren't super familiar and why it's difficult to unpack VP6. So here we have a slide from a workshop that Sean and I gave a while back. Basically, this is a high level overview of the purpose of a packer. And so what we have on the left hand side here, probably your right, is we have an example of a PE file in which we can actually trace the code execution. So we can see well, these are just representing functions. So we can see like this function calls this function, calls this function. So this would be like a normal setup for a PE. As it's running, the PE will need to call out to libraries. We call this the Windows API. So a bunch of DLLs that are used to interact with the Windows operating system. Obviously, most PE files will need to interact with the Windows OS. Otherwise, they're not really doing anything. And the way that they interact with it is they make these calls out to DLLs that allow this interaction. Now, in another video that I did talking about I pro tips for unpacking. I talked a little bit about the different layers in Windows, the different API layers. I talked about kernel 32 DLL and then ntdll.dll and how you can trace execution through those. So if, if you're not familiar with this, go watch that video and it should explain a little bit more about what I'm talking about. So you kind of need to understand that in order to get what I'm going to talk about today. As the binary is running, uh, it's making these calls out to the Windows API. What I'm trying to show you here in the slide is that on the left hand side, uh, you can inspect these functions and you could actually read like what they're doing. So you don't really need to go to the Windows API. But let's say this is a black box. Let's say for some reason, you're actually not able to see those function calls. So you're not able to trace them for some reason. And this will be really apparent in a minute when I open up Ida and show you what VV6 looks like. So let's say you're actually not able to see the different functions that are calling each other, etc, etc, at runtime, you're still going to be able to see those calls out to the Windows API. In order to do anything, the binder needs to make those calls. In our tutorial here to Today, we are going to actually monitor those Windows API calls. And by monitoring them, we are going to be able to hopefully not have to look at the code execution in the binary itself and simply by monitoring those APIs unpack it. We're just going to hook NT calls from those hooks. We should be able to extract whatever is injected. With that, uh, let's actually jump into IDA. Once we jump in there, I'll be able to show you guys why we're not able to look at the actual the calls that are being made inside VB6. Let's open up IDA. I have a Visual Basic VB6 packer that I'm going to work through with today. Let's open that up. It's in my shared drive, vb 6 packexe So I'm going to open this up. If you guys remember, my setup is two virtual machines, one Windows 7 running IDA and one XP running the IDA remote debugger. So that's that's my setup today. And I have a shared folder in between them, which you saw me just go and grab the vb 6 exe from. So let's open this up. Yeah, it's a PE file. And once it opens up, you're going to see why it's difficult to to unpack VB6. The analysis is finished and this is what we're left with. We're left with a uh, push of this D word with a bunch of data, it's a pointer to a bunch of data, and then a call into VB6 DLL. If we go and look at our imports here, what I wanna show you is the way that VB6 works is you write code in a language that is interpreted by the VB6 runtime. You're not writing in a language that gets compiled into assembly. You're writing in a language that will be interpreted by the VB6 VB6 DLL. And if you guys are familiar with how Java works with Java bytecode, this is very similar. In order for this to work, you will see that the PE file needs to import the MSVB M60 DLL. And that's the 
only DLL that it's importing. So this is how you kind of tell that something is a VB6. So there's other ways to tell, there's other like tricks in the PE file, but really what you want to do is just look at the imports of the PE file. And if it has one import and that import is MSVB VM60, then it's a VB6 PE file. That's the only DLL that it's going to import. Obviously, if we look at this, there's we can't really make much sense of it. It's going to send that, that bytecode data. Bytecode is not the right terminology, but it's kind of a concept that it's easy to understand. So it's gonna send that bytecode into DLL and the DLL is then gonna act like a virtual machine and it's going to execute that code. Without having introspection into that VB6 virtual machine, without being able to actually like inspect the runtime, which we, we don't have tools to do that. Instead, what you need to do is you need to look at all the API calls that are coming out uh, during runtime. And I'm gonna show you what that looks like and that's gonna be the, the bulk of the tutorial today. So so we're going to set this up in a debugger. We are going to hook some APIs and we are going to watch and see what actually happens without having to inspect the VB6 code. Because as you can see here, if we go to our start again, as you can see, you can't make sense of it. It's in a different language that is not interpreted by IDA, which is why I wanted to show you that slide when we first started out where we don't really have an idea of what's actually happening at execution. We only have the API calls that are coming out of it. Without further ado, let's start this up in the remote debugger and let's set our API hooks and take a look and see what happens. Okay, we'll start executing. And here we jump to the breakpoint that we set in start and we can see all of our uh, DLLs are loaded here. In order to understand why we're setting the breakpoints where we are, you'll recall in another tutorial that I did on unpacking that there are two common ways to inject code into a remote pro process. Um, there's lots of different ways, but two really common ways. First is to use the map view section uh, to actually map a view into that process and then write the code that way. And the second way is to use a direct write with write virtual memory. So you just write into the process. Uh, what we want to do is we want to set hooks on both the write virtual memory and the map view section and see which technique it uses. And then we also want to set hooks on anti resume thread. That's how the process is resumed after the write is done into the process. And we want to set a hook on create process internal W. Now, I went over that kind of quickly because I'm expecting that you guys did watch the other tutorial where I talk about these different techniques. I'll just mention really quickly the order that we expect this to be happening for injection into a remote process. First, you need to create the process. So that's where the create internal process comes from. Then you need to actually write your malicious code into the process somehow. So you have to use the map view of section or write virtual memory. And third, you need to resume ex execution of that process. And that's where the resume thread comes in. So we're going to set those hooks and then we're going to run and see if we can't extract the code that's going to be injected. Now you might be wondering, well, what if it doesn't use process injection? What if the sample is actually injecting into itself, which is another you know technique that you could use. You could inject code into your own process. I always check when I'm doing VB6 unpacking, I always check this remote process first. It is very, very common for the unpacker to want to exit its own process and start something else that it's injected the code into. That's not always the case. There are other packers out there which like to inject into themselves. With VB6 packers, it's more common for them to do injection into a remote process. So I test that first. But I do want to note that with our setup here, where we have the virtual machine set up as our victim host, I'm pretty fearless in just going ahead and testing this hypothesis because I know that if it gets away on me, if I chose wrong and this is actually a self-injection, I don't have to worry about it too much. I have a snapshot of the VM. I'll just reset to the snapshot and try again. I think at some point I will make a video on how to do like self-injection and how to check for that, but it is a little bit more advanced and especially with VB6 because uh, VB6 existed before data execution production uh, was a thing in Windows. So things are a little bit more complex, but I think what I want to do is I want to kind of build up to that so you can watch watch these videos and, and still get a good handle of what's going on. And I, I also want to mention that, uh, like I said before, it, it is much, much, much more likely when you're dealing with VB6 that they will be injecting into a remote process. So you, this is this technique that I'm showing you here is going to serve you well for the majority of stuff that you have to deal with. Okay, so let's set our hooks. Let's set the uh, kernel 32 one first. We want to do create, create process internal W. If you watched my other tutorial videos, I went over the differences 
differences between the A and W. A is for ASCII, W is for wide. And the fact that in Windows, the ASCII calls are actually just, they actually just redirect internally to the wide string calls, the W calls. So you only have to hook the wide string ones. It kind of cuts down on the number of hooks you have to set. Okay, let's jump there and we will set a breakpoint. And then let's set our breakpoints for uh, NTDLL. And we want to set uh, NT, NT resume thread. Add that breakpoint. And we want to add one for uh, NT write virtual memory. All right, virtual memory. Okay. Add that breakpoint. We want to do one for NT map, NT map view of section. With the map and unmap view of section technique, we would need to set breakpoints on NT unmap view of section, but I'm only setting this one now because we'll be able to tell quickly which technique the malware is using, and then we can set the breakpoints accordingly. So if we find that it is using NT map view of section, then we'll need to actually set more breakpoints, but let's, let's try it out first and see. We can always uh, stop the debugger and then restart later on if we choose the wrong breakpoints. So let's run this. Uh, looks like we're at uh, NT map view section, but we haven't created a process yet, so we don't really care. Uh, more map view section, we don't care. We don't care. We don't care. We don't care. Okay, I'm going to actually disable this. Uh, so what's happening is NT map view section is very common. It's used a lot, so it's being called, but again, we haven't hit create process internal, so there's no uh, process to inject into. So I'm actually just going to disable this for right now, and uh, we can re-enable it once we create our process. So let's run for a bit here. And, uh, oh, we have a uh, floating point inexact result. Mm, you know what? I'm just going to pass that. I'm going to continue execution, pass it to the app. I don't really care about that for right now. Oh, and we've hit, hey, look at that. We've hit our breakpoint. So it looks like this is going to create a process. So it's probably going to do some process injection. Uh, we can take a look at what the process name is that it's creating. Remember, I have another tutorial on how to read API calls off the stack. So I'm just going to actually do that really quickly right now and show you guys. Uh, let's pop over here. We'll go to our stack and uh, let's set our ASCII string style to Unicode. Oh, it's already a Unicode because we're going to be dealing with wide strings. So give me that string. Okay, so it looks like it's going to create another version of its own process. So this is like a common technique in malware where they create a suspended version of their own process. So they have like their process, they create a new process, but using the same image. Uh, so using the malware image, but they create it suspended and then they inject into that by using process hollowing where they basically remove all the code inside the process that they started and then inject their own code. So I think that's what that's what it looks like they're going to be doing here. Let's uh, continue on. I'm going to reset that map view of section breakpoint that I disabled before. So I'm going to re-enable that. And then let's run and see what happens. Okay, so they have an NT map view section. And if you guys recall where we were using this technique and I had to note down the section handles and then the remote address and the local address where the section is mapped. So I'm gonna do that for this one as well if we find that this is doing a map view of section type injection. But we don't know that it's doing that yet because we're only seeing one section mapped here. So I'm going to let it execute a little bit more and see, you know, if this is the technique that it's using. And the, the reason why is because until anti resume thread is called, we're, we're pretty safe. Like we can execute until that's called without having to, to reset the virtual environment or anything like that, because we know that that the process that's being injected into won't be resumed until anti resume thread is called. So we're pretty f free to keep running here in the debugger and then we can always just stop the debugger and restart it later again if we if we need to look at NT map view section technique. What I'm looking for here is I'm looking to see if as we continue executing if there are any write virtual memory calls because if there are write virtual memory calls and they're actually writing data in it's generally a good indication that they're using that technique and not the map view section technique. And, and the reason why if it looks like I'm hesitant to to actually dive in and say like okay it's the map view, map view section technique and set up all those breakpoints is because it's time intensive if they're using that technique. So I'd rather just make sure that they're not using the uh, right virtual memory technique first before I go through the rigmarole of setting up those breakpoints. So, okay, they're calling NT map view of section again. Um, okay, so it looks like they might be doing NT map view of section. 
Um, let's see here. Oh, now they're calling uh, NT write virtual memory. So it looks like maybe they're using a mixture of the two techniques. I might have to go back and set some breakpoints properly for NT uh, map view of section, unmap view of section, create section. But again, we can, let's keep running and see which APIs they call before they get to NT resume thread. And then we'll make our decision once we get there about what technique they're actually using. So let's keep executing. Yep, more of this stuff, more right virtual memory. So now it's kind of looking like maybe there is, maybe this is gonna be a, uh, a right virtual memory uh, type injection. Keep doing this. Now we can see, we'll go back to our stack view here. Let's in inspect this, uh, let's inspect this memory address. Ooh, ooh, what's this? Okay, so I see something interesting here. So this is the uh, memory, just, just to recap what I did there. In, uh, so, if we look at the API call for NT write virtual memory, let's pop over to our browser here. Pop over here. Let's take a look here. Memory, please. Virtual memory, NT write virtual memory. Okay, this is the API call. What I'm looking at here is on the stack, I'm gonna see the handle to the process that we wanna to write to. So we can write to our own process or a remote process, depending on the handle. The base address, which is the address that we wanna to write to, and a buffer which contains the data that we wanna write. What I just showed you in IDA is I took a look at the, uh, so remember this is the handle, so D8, this is the address. You can see this is actually a remote address in vv6pack.exe, that's the process that we just created. And then here is the pointer on the stack to the buffer that we want to write to that remote process. So what I did was I took a look at that buffer in our own process to see what was contained in it. And we see what looks like the mz bytes for a PE file. So let's scroll down a little bit. Oh yeah, there's the DOS string. This program can be run in Win32, under Win32. And we can scroll down, oh, there's PE. So it looks like, and remember, this is a buffer that we're gonna be writing into the remote process. As we were going, as we were stepping through those APIs, remember I, I was thinking like, okay, well, if it turns out this is a uh, map on map view of section type injection technique, then I'll have to restart the debugger and set up my breakpoints for that. Uh, remember I said it's much easier if it's anti-write virtual memory because we can just copy the buffer directly out. Now, actually, if we pop back to our definition here, we can see that the fourth argument on the stack is gonna be the number of bytes to write. Over here, we can see that they only write, wanna write 400 hex bytes, which is not gonna be the entire program. Let's, <laughs> let's be realistic. That's, that's not enough to really actually do anything unless it's a very, very small PE. So what I suspect is gonna be happening is I suspect they're gonna be writing a bunch of different sections to the PE file. But here's the trick. We know in our local process that there is a buffer that contains PE file being written into the remote process. So one thing we can do is instead of having to follow each one of those write virtual memory API calls and take each section out that's written to the remote process and then rebuild the PE file out of that, let's inspect our buffer here further and see if more than 400 hex bytes down if there's still more interesting PE data. Because what might have happened is they might have actually unpacked the entire PE payload in the memory of our process, and then they're gonna write it in sections into the remote process. And if that's the case, we don't have to step through all these different API calls. We just copy out the buffer and call it a day. So let's take a closer look at this buffer here. And the way to do that is to take a look at it in hex mode. So I'm gonna just copy that address there. And then to open up a, uh, a hex view, I'm just gonna open up a new hex window. And I'm gonna use that um, G command to ask it to jump to an address. 
paste in the address of the buffer and jump to it. So here we can see the mzp here. Looks like the start of, of the PE file in our memory buffer. If you look up here, I mentioned this in another video, but unallocated free virtual memory will have this pattern, this FEEE. -E. So we know that that's like unallocated space. And then let's sort of scroll down so we can see all we're doing is we're, we're going to inspect this PE file in, in the buffer and see if there is still more interesting data lower than the uh, 400 hex bytes that we're going to write to the remote process. Because if there is more PE data below that, then what we know is that there is most likely a full PE file sitting in our buffer in our own process, and they are going to take sections and write those sections into the remote process. So if that's the case, then we can probably just dump that buffer and try and rebuild the PE out of that, which is much faster. So let's take a look here and see. We'll do some quick math here and uh, make sure that our calculator is in hex mode. And so let's say D90 plus 400 hex gives us 1190. So we're going to be at 1190. 1190. 1190. Okay, looks like this is still part of the PE file. And if we scroll down here, I don't see unallocated memory. So it looks like there's probably more going on here in the buffer than what we're just writing to the remote process. So I'm just gonna scroll down a little bit more and see if this looks like it's still the PE file. And, and it does, this looks like a setup for a PE file. This looks like, these look like the different sections. And then we scroll down here and we can see, oh, look, there, it looks like this is actually the full PE file sitting in our buffer. Even though we're only writing those like four 400 hex bytes, it looks like it's the full PE file. So let's scroll down even further. Now we don't know how big this PE file is. We could just dump out the PE header and look at the header and, and count the size of the raw sections and get an idea of how big the PE is from that. But that sounds like a lot of work. And what I'd rather do is I'd rather just scroll down in the buffer until I hit some unallocated memory and see if I can't just copy that out. Or if I get to the end of this virtual segment, uh, virtual memory segment, and maybe just I'll just copy that out. So I'm just going to scroll down pretty quickly here. Remember in the other tutorials that I do, I mentioned that if you're rebuilding a PE file and you actually copy out more data than what's required by the PE, it doesn't really matter. It'll rebuild no problem. What I like to do is I just, all, the only thing you can't do is not copy enough data. So I'd rather just scroll down and, and copy pretty much everything from this buffer out and take a look at that. There we go. There is some, it looks like that's the end there. We're at uh, 288824. So I have to actually go back to this address where the PE is. So I'll, instead of copying up, I'll just copy down now because I know this is the beginning here. So let's just grab these things. So we're gonna highlight, I'm holding the shift key uh, and I'm gonna scroll down. I'm gonna use that same technique I used before where I'm clicking in the scroll bar because that's a little bit faster. And I know I need to get down to somewhere around 288 something. This is a little bit tedious, but trust me, it's a lot faster than having to go and, and copy out the data that's injected for each API call, each write virtual memory call, and then reconstruct that. It's gonna be a lot more tedious. So this is this is a little bit faster, even though it seems like it's kind of a, a lot of work. I also wanna note that I, I think with a real debugger, uh, this is way, way faster because you can just you know dump memory in a, a more reasonable fashion. But again, it's I find it's easier to explain in tutorials with the IDA view because we can look at the binary and the debugger at the same time. So it's I find it's easier to explain that way. Here we've got to the end. So I'm, I'm still holding shift. I'm gonna click here and you see I've highlighted all these bytes and then I can just right click on them and save to file. And I'm gonna call this dump dot bin. Okay. Okay. So we've copied out that uh, buffer and we're going to now take a look at it and see if we can't rebuild that back into a PE file. But there's one more thing that we need to do. I've explained this <laughs> to death, but I'm going to mention it one more time. The difference between a PE file that is mapped in memory, so ready to be executed as a process, and in its unmapped format as a file on disk. There's two existences for a PE file. It can be mapped in memory, ready to be run as a process, or unmapped as a file on disk. The, the big hurdle here when you're done 
dumping PEs is you don't really know if you're dumping them like I am just raw out of a buffer. You don't know whether they're in the mapped or unmapped for format. So you kind of just have to test both. If this was existing in the remote process, so after all those writes, I would know that it was mapped for sure because it's ready to be executed. But because it exists in a buffer that's been probably unpacked inside our own process, I don't know whether it was unpacked and it's being turned into a mapped or unmapped version. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna copy the address where the MZ was written or that the very beginning of the PE file would have been written in the remote process because if we have to unmap it, we need to know the base address that it was written at when it was mapped. So remember on the stack here, the uh, write virtual memory calls, the first argument is the handle, the second argument is is the, the pointer to the base address. So here we can see it's four and five zeros, one, two, three, four, five. So I'm gonna actually just note that down. So it's four and five zeros after it was the is the potential base address where this is mapped, if it is mapped. And we don't really need the debugger anymore because we have that file that's dumped. All we have to do now is test whether it's in its mapped or unmapped format. Let's stop the debug session. We'll minimize this now. So I'm just gonna, before I forget, I'm gonna open up Notepad or Notepad++, and I'm just gonna note down that base address in case we need it. Four and one, two, three, four, five zeros was the base, or I guess I would say potential, potential base. All right, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna keep that for right now in case we need it later. Here's a file that we dumped. Remember when we copied it, we copied a couple extra bytes at the beginning of the file because just because of the way that it was offset when we highlighted that text. So we need to clean that up first before we do anything else. Move this file over to our share folder and use a decent hex editor. So let's pop over to local window here. We'll open up a hex editor. Uh, let's open that file and it's dumped up in, let's open that up. And we can see here there's a couple bytes uh, before that MZ that we copied out. So let's just delete those bytes. There we go, so the file starts with the MZP or MZ. So let's save this and new fixed dot bin. All right, so we've saved that. Let's go back over to our VM with IDA. Remember I said that we're not sure exactly whether, because we dumped this from a buffer, we're not sure whether it's in the mapped or unmapped format. One thing you can do is you can actually just open this up with IDA and see whether IDA complains about being able to read it. Because IDA will expect an unmapped PE. It'll expect it to be in the, the file format on disk. You can just open it up and see whether I, IDA complains. The other thing we could do is we could just use Hasherzade's amazing uh, PE unmap tool and try to unmap it automatically and see whether that fails. So we have two, two options here, but what I'll do is I'll just open it up in IDA. Okay, let's take a look here, uh, new file. Let's actually open the one that we, we fixed on our share drive here. So dump fixed up in, open that up. Uh, yes, it's PE file. Oh, 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 it's loaded fine. Okay, so uh, good news. We've actually successfully dumped the PE file. And let's check the imports, make sure, yeah, we got imports. We got the start, we jumped to start, yes. It's valid code, we're just check. So what we're doing now is we're checking to make sure that this, because Ida has expected the file to be in its unmapped version. So if everything looks good, then it means that it was in the unmapped version. So uh, yeah, looks good here. And if we look down, yeah, we got our functions, hop over to them. Yeah, everything looks good. There's no wonky code, no errors, which is great. So it looks like we have successfully unpacked a VB6 uh, packed PE file. And now we can continue our analysis. This has been kind of a quick tutorial where I just showed you how, you know, some quick steps to, to use to, to try and circumvent actually needing to examine VB6 code because again, there, there are no good tools to do that. You kind of have to use this API hooking approach. And I've also showed you just to recap, if they're using a write virtual memory technique to inject into a remote process, you can kind of take a shortcut. And if you find the buffer where the PE file has been unpacked in the memory of your own process, you can actually copy that PE file out instead of having to watch each one of those API calls. Hopefully you can apply those tricks going forward when you guys unpack VB6 samples, so hopefully it's useful. So I hope you enjoyed that blast from the past as much as I did. And hopefully soon we will have some more time to make some new videos for you guys. We've received a lot of requests to do different malware samples and we have a queue of them now. So we will be working through that. And there's also a few comments asking us to go more in detail into some of our malware analysis techniques, which we're also going to cover. So stay tuned for that. We're just super busy right now, but we should be back on track pretty soon. And of course, we're always responding to comments. So if you have a comment about what you saw or you want to request a certain type of video or technique, 
technique that we should cover, uh, remember just to leave a comment below. And of course, if you enjoy what you saw, remember to subscribe down below. We'll try and be putting out one video a week, every week. Hopefully we can keep this up. <laughs> Say that every week and we, and we never can. <laughs> and until next week, keep exposing the mechanics behind the malware and stay curious. Thank you